Hello, my name's Jancis Robinson, and I'm what they call a wine expert, because I'm a master of wine, and I earn my living pontificating about wine. But I know I have no special gifts, it's just that I've been lucky enough to have been exposed to the fantastic people and places that produce this delicious drink. Twenty-five years ago at Oxford, Bill Clinton was walking out with a friend of mine and I was studying maths and philosophy. I must have been quite brainy then. The careers advisor suggested marketing or computers. While I was at university, I had a particularly well-heeled boyfriend, which meant that I ate out so well I eventually became the university's restaurant critic. One night he took me out to dinner and ordered a bottle of wine just like this one that was to change my life. I'd hardly come across wine before coming to Oxford. Very few English people had in the 50s and 60s, but I soon got the hang of it. My very first sip of this red burgundy, a Chambon Musigny Les Amoureuses, 1959, opened my eyes to the fact that wine can be so much more than just lubrication. It's the liquid expression of a place, a person and a year, and mm, there's just the sheer thrill or thrills that truly great wine can give you. That wine made me realise that what I was really interested in wasn't maths and philosophy, but eating and drinking. And I've somehow managed to make a living out of it ever since. This is a typical working day for me nowadays. As a wine writer based in London, I might set off straight after breakfast to taste a hundred tough young reds. Turning pleasure into pain is an occupational hazard. As is this particularly nasty habit. Excuse me while I work. But this is definitely play one of the perks of the job. An invitation to a modest wine farm called Chateau Margot in Bordeaux. I do occasionally have to go on field research trips. And of course, you can't really judge a wine unless you have it with food and discuss it with the people who make it. But I promise you, this is very unlike the average day spent hunched over a word processor at Chateau Robinson. <clears throat> this is the bit of the working day I most look forward to. The end. <laughs> Even though my work may involve tasting a hundred wines in a morning, I never get tired of this delicious drink. You know, wine is not a serious subject. Its point is to give pleasure. It's one of life's perks. It makes food and even people seem that little bit more scintillating. The trouble is, though, that we're all living in the shadow of a time when wine was something that only an elite drank which means we still tend to think that only experts are allowed to know about it. Which is absolute rubbish. What you think about a wine is the only thing that need matter to you. It's like grab in France. Could I be a real creep and try the Pinot Noir? 
bit in the middle of the road or a bit wishy-washy. It's got a lovely sort of raisin taste to it as well. <laughs> Wine professionals like this lot have no special powers, you know. Anyone with a sense of smell and an interest in wine can be a wine taster. Tasting is so subjective and the jargon so imprecise that your impressions and your words are every bit as valid as theirs. They can't agree, so why should you? Disgusting. No, that's brilliant. <laughs> I really like I this wine. I hate that. I really hate What are we looking at? We're looking at this <laughs> really great Rhine girl. <laughs> Smells of rice pudding. Yeah, I think it's got delicious. something to offer. Summer's like Dean, picnic, sourdough sure, food. Mm. It's Dechow wine on a yeah. bad day. All these instant judgments depend on that fleeting moment when liquid meets palate. But actually, in professional wine tasting, the palate's the last thing they use. The first thing's the eye, especially if they're indulging in that very silly game called blind tasting, trying to work out what mystery wines are. Because the look of a wine can give you all sorts of clues. The browner a wine, whatever the colour, the older it is. Reds go from deep purple to pale brick, while white wines deepen with age. If a red wine's very deep coloured, it may be either very young or made from very ripe grapes, which can help you guess the vintage year, or from a grape variety that's particularly thick skinned, such as Cabernet Sauvignon or Nebbiolo. The amount of brick tinge at the rim can tell you how old it is, the more orange and less blue, the older the wine. The standard way to look at a wine's colour is to tilt the glass away from you against a white background. You find real winos pulling out their cuffs if there's no white tablecloth. And it helps, of course, if the glass is as thin as possible and completely plain, no colour or engraving to distract you. But the next stage in wine tasting is the most important, and it involves not the eye or the mouth, but our most sensitive tasting organ by far. See how badly these supermarket tasters do when deprived of what their noses are capable of telling them, and of clues from the colour. This is why food seems so completely tasteless to someone with a heavy cold, and why a damaged sense of smell is the only obstacle to becoming a crack wine taster. The best tasters tend to be between 30 and 60, and female. But you'd think even a man could spot the difference between tuna and yoghurt. Wrong. Have a drink and tell me what you can taste. Thank you. Thank you. What can you taste, Sam? It sounds like tastes like chlorinated water. That's all right. Like chlorinated water. Yeah. <laughs> What taste anything? It's just warm, wet, nothing else. Nothing at all. Nothing, just like water. <laughs> Take your clip off and uh, see if you can mm. see, work out what it is. Hmm, <laughs> almond. Vanilla. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Cabbage water or Brussels sprouts <laughs> or something. <laughs> but quite drinkable if you've got a clip on your nose. Wine tasting is to a large extent an attempt to persuade wine to give up as much vapour, as many flavour messages as possible. Swirling it round like this helps because it maximises the wine's surface area and encourages thousands of little flavour messages to escape and collect in the glass. That only works, of course, if the glass goes in towards the rim so you don't lose anything, and if the glass isn't too full, otherwise there's nowhere for the flavour messages to collect. Among wine fanatics, it's considered sensible rather than mean to fill glasses no more than half full. You just have to top them up more often. The glass should ideally also have a stem so you can swirl easily without affecting the wine's all-important temperature. So the business of actually tasting begins with two or three swirls and a concentrated sniff. Mmm. All that sensual pleasure and still alcohol's played no part in it. In fact, it would be perfectly possible to be a great wine taster and a complete teetotaler, because the nose, our most sensitive bit of tasting equipment, is helped in only a minor way by thousands of tiny taste buds all over the inside of the mouth, but hardly at all in the throat. You don't actually have to swallow a wine to taste it, which is why we professionals spit for a living. And sometimes, when we have to taste a hundred wines a day, we spit to live. But 
We want to put as much of the inside of our mouths in contact with wine as possible. And we like to draw in a bit of air to encourage yet more flavour messages up to the nose from the back of the mouth, which is why we look and sound quite so disgusting when we taste wine. Behind every taste thrill and every wine label is a vineyard, almost invariably in some beautiful corner of the world, often following traditions that go back centuries. Is it about the fruit of the vine that's so special? Why hasn't the fermented juice of the orange or peach been celebrated by generation after generation? Well, the grape's not just any old fruit. For a start, it has a special sort of acid that can preserve its juice for decades, even centuries. And it has much more sugar than most fruits, not to make sweet wine, but to make strong wine because nearly all the sugar is going to be turned into alcohol. You can't see them, but all around me, in the atmosphere of any wine region, there are millions of invisible yeasts whose natural inclination is to ferment sugar into alcohol. The winemaker doesn't have to do a thing. Although lots of less traditional producers believe in adding their own yeasts because they're frightened of things they can't control. During fermentation, the yeasts turn sweet grape juice into dry wine. As the sugar level goes down, the alcohol level goes up and lots of carbon dioxide is given off. So much so, in fact, that the atmosphere around here is quite heady with gas, grape smells, and alcohol. Mm. This, to me, is the smell of autumn. And this, to the Rhone Valley stompers, is the sound of autumn. Twice a day, for more than a week, these guys have to risk falling into this lethal mixture. Why? Because what makes red wines red is the skins. All grapes are the same dull grey inside. But grape skins have the unfortunate habit of floating to the top of the fermentation vat. This muscle building method is just one way, the most traditional, of making sure that as much colour and flavour is leached into the wine as possible. The pigeage, the stomping, looks terribly dangerous. Has nobody ever fallen in? Uh, no, usually because firing people costs us a lot of money. When we want to fire somebody, we send them to the pigeage. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, no, it's not so dangerous because the strength of the power of the carbonic gas, the power of pushing, is very hard. And if we do that by feet and not by hand, it's because by hand we don't have enough strength. So we have to go in the vat to push down the cap. And the goal is to break this cap to permit the carbonic gas to, goes, to go away and like that to look for a better skin contact between the juice and the skin and to extract as much as possible tannins. Tannin, from grape skins and oak barrels, is the defining ingredient in serious red wine. Tannin can taste horribly like stewed tea in young reds, 
that helps them stay in shape for the years needed while really subtle flavors develop. The evolution of fine wine may be exasperatingly slow, but the wine world itself is evolving at breakneck speed. Every year, wine producers from all over the world converge on London to hear the results of a 6,000 bottle wine tasting. This is the annual Wine Challenge Awards dinner, the Oscars of the wine trade. But these people are here not for the socializing or the meal, they're hungry for something else. Now, wine makers of the year. If Ignacio Recoberan of Chile were to get the award he's dying for, it could double his sales overnight. If Peter Milan were to win a gong, it would be a real shot in the arm for the emerging wine industry of the new South Africa. They're all here, producers from the revered old world and the cocky new world, because this is where you get your name on the map. It was the 1994 Casablanca Sauvignon uh, Sauvignon Blanc white label and would Ignacio Recabaran of Casablanca Vineyards like to like to Competition in today's rapidly changing wine world is ferocious. New wines, whole new wine regions are emerging all the time, jockeying for orders from fewer and fewer retailers. What everyone here is hoping for is some millimeter of advantage over the person at the next table. For hundreds of thousands of ordinary wine producers who can't get into this room, you haven't even heard of the International Wine Challenge or any other wine competition. Life is much more difficult. As a species, they're heading for extinction. Because paradoxically, even though more and more people care about the quality of wine, they're actually drinking less and less of it, with catastrophic results in the great wine-producing nations. Throughout southern Europe, and especially in France and Italy, the people who used to drink wine by the bucketful are dying off. In the last 30 years, the French have cut their wine consumption by half. Workers who would traditionally down a litre of rough red a day without batting an eyelid are being replaced by a generation which wants rather more from their wine than just liquid, alcohol and a few calories. This is the Languedoc in southern France. Planted a century ago to supply cheap wine to the industrial north, it's the world's biggest wine region, and scene of the most dramatic, even traumatic, change of all. Louis Ballester is what most people would imagine when they think of a typical vigneron. In fact, he's never made a drop of wine in his life. All he does is grow grapes. But the world no longer needs Louis Ballester and his ilk, and his way of life is about to change irrevocably. Ballester and his neighbours grow tough old Carignan grapes, still five times more common in France than fashionable Chardonnay. They sell every one to the local co-op, and their main concern is to deliver as many of them as possible, never mind the quality. Bordeaux and Burgundy may be famous, but the French wine trade was based on vast quantities of the sort of vin, extremely ordinaire, measured purely in terms of its strength, which once lubricated every household in the land. Real Frenchmen may or may not have eaten quiche, but they certainly didn't drink water. All that's changed, though. <laughs>
Je dis bien, c'est vrai, c'est vrai, vous voyez. Parce que quand vous avez des emprunts à rembourser, tout ça est là, le crédit agricole, il faut que ça tombe. Quoique, si vous êtes trop embêté, ils sont quand même assez coulants, cool, mais il faut payer quand même de toute manière, vous comprenez. Il y a des années, c'est difficile. Hein. This is no year in Provence, but a peasant's lifetime in the Languedoc, and less idyllic than it looks. Not just in France, but in Italy, Spain, Portugal and Greece, the big problem is that there are still thousands of small-time vine growers producing plonk that younger generations just aren't interested in. By the early 90s, a third of all French adults said they didn't drink wine at all. The result is that co-ops like this, which haven't woken up to the consumer revolution, are going to the wall. Surplus wine ends up down the road at the rival establishment. Chateau Despair, an official distillery where Europe's wine lake is distilled into an alcohol lake. Some of it's used as industrial solvent, though it does nothing to solve the wine industry's problems. This does. Arrachage, or vine pulling. All over Europe, people like Louis Ballester, who won't or can't make the leap to quality, are being paid to tear up their vines forever. L'arrachage pour moi c'est c'est quelque chose de très triste parce que c'est la fin de, du vignoble du vignoble de, de, de la région. Eh? C'est c'est le désert. Vous voulez bien, c'est le désert. Alors il n'y aura plus de vignes. Ça fait perdre toute l'économie. Et puis quand on a été viticulteur comme moi depuis des années, quand on voit ça, c'est affreux. C'est la fin de tout. Vous comprenez? But if time-worn men like Louis Ballester represent the old face of the wine world, now surplus to requirements, its new face is very different. Sarah Kynock is typical of those who call the shots in today's wine trade. Barely 30, she travels the world, selecting wine for one of the large British supermarket chains, buying about $80 million worth of wine a year. She has quite terrifying power. In a single morning, she might order a fleet of tanker loads of wine. She can make or break a small wine producer just by the giving or taking away of a single order. Today, she's in the foothills of the Pyrenees to sniff out a possible new supplier, who, if successful, will have to submit to her every whim. The Boiro family, husband, wife, daughter and son-in-law, have worked hard to build up a small wine estate near Limou. They've yet to crack the dynamic British wine market, but would dearly love to sell not by the bottle at the roadside, but by the container load to a large supermarket. Supermarket buyers must get the impression that dust never falls in a wine producer's house. The arrival of the queen of Safeway. Despite the power they wield, supermarket buyers are not necessarily experts. Last year, they may have been buying baked beans. Next year, washing up liquid. The most frustrating moment is, um, is when we're actually doing the tasting and they are fussing over the, the wine that's being poured. What I most like is to have the wine in front of me, to have the bottles behind the glasses and to be able to taste one after the other and go up and down the line and just think about what's in the glasses and to have someone saying, what do you think of it? And how, you know, do you like this one better than that one? And did you know that we did this to, that it's just so confusing. Just to have those few moments when you're actually tasting the product, um, when it's silent and you can make notes, is good. 
And what do you use? Um, you, you use your feminine charm or sheer volume of order to get the price down? Uh, I think a bit of both. I think feminine charm definitely comes into it. I mean, what's the point of having it if you don't use it? Um, and, and also the, the, the volume. I mean, the volume is always a big, a big carrot to a supplier. Are you ever aware that you've screwed a producer down so much that he's actually losing money on the deal? Somebody once told me that there is no such thing as the best deal because whatever two people agree on will be OK for them. Now, I have to believe in my job that nobody will give me a price that will mean they're going to go bankrupt because that would be plain stupid. And if I was always worrying about somebody going bankrupt, I'd never do the right deal. So I have to, I have to believe that they are, um, they, they are sufficiently aware of their own finances to know how low they can go. If you've got a supplier that's supplying you with 40, 50, 60,000 cases of wine and you say to them, we're not going to deal with you next year, the immediate question is why, and you say, well, somebody can do ten centimes better and they say well, well so can we you know we'll do it we'll do this ten centimes and you say yeah but their quality is just slightly better but how you know how how is it better show us the wine we'll match it we'll match it exactly and actually what you're trying to get at is that for that you don't reason, love them anymore you don't love them anymore and that that's actually the most difficult way of, of dropping a supplier Eight agonising months later, Sarah Kynock finally makes her decision, and it's no. The Wuros have been left standing by competition from abroad. The wine world's certainly changing at a faster rate than ever before. And many of those changes directly benefit us consumers. All over the world, not just in France, people are drinking less and less wine yet they know and care more and more about the quality of it. So competitive is this flooded, cutthroat wine market that producers can only stay afloat if they're genuinely trying to make better wine every year. And the great thing about this international wine surplus is that in real terms, ordinary to medium quality wine costs about the same now as it did 10 years ago, yet the quality has gone zooming up. In the programmes that follow, my aim is to help you navigate your way round the dynamic world of wine. And the best way to do that is to get to grips with the main wine grape varieties, which do more than anything else to determine how a wine's going to taste, and are now planted just about everywhere. I have seen the future of wine, and its name is Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay.